Hey guys. Hey Bo. Uh, hi Bo. Flippin' physics. Ladies and gentlemen, people, the bell has rung, therefore class has begun, therefore you should be seated in your seat ready and excited to do another uniformly accelerated motion problem. Absolutely. Yes. Oh boy. Good. Last time we did an introductory uniformly accelerated motion problem. Today we're going to do a slightly more complicated UAM problem. Uh, Bobby, could you please read the problem? A toy car starts from rest and experiences an acceleration of 1.56 meters per second squared for 1.6 seconds, and then breaks for 1.1 seconds and experiences an acceleration of negative 2.07 meters per second squared. Part A. How fast is the car going at the end of the braking period? And Part B. How far has it moved? All right, now let's translate the problem to physics. Bobby, could you please read again? And Billy, could you please translate? A toy car starts from rest and experiences an acceleration of 1.56 meters per second squared for 1.6 seconds and then... Please stop. A equals 1.56 meters per second squared and T equals 1.6 seconds. Please say what the letters mean and not just the letters themselves. The more you actually say what the letters mean, the more you'll understand the physics, and that's good. Sorry, I knew that. Acceleration equals 1.56 meters per second squared, and time equals 1.6 seconds. That's okay, Billy. Uh, Bobby, please keep reading. Uh, and then breaks for 1.1 seconds and experiences an acceleration of negative 2.07 meters per second squared. Time equals 1.1 seconds, and acceleration equals negative 2.07 meters per second squared. That doesn't look good. No, it doesn't. True, we can't have the same variable equal to two different numbers, that just doesn't make any sense. For example, if time is equal to 1.6 seconds and time is equal to 1.1 seconds, then 1.6 seconds equals 1.1 seconds, which doesn't make any sense. So what are we going to do about this? I think we need to split the problem into two parts. Yeah, so, so then 1.56 meters per second squared is the acceleration for the first part, and negative 2.07 meters per second squared is the acceleration for the second part. Likewise, the 1.6 seconds is the time for the first part, and the 1.1 seconds is the time for the second part. And the way that we indicate the variables are for two different parts of a problem is by using subscripts. So you can we see we have the acceleration for part one, and the time for part one, and then the acceleration for part two, and the time for part two. Bobby, please keep reading. Part A, how fast is the car going at the end of the braking period? And part B, how far has it moved? Part A, velocity final equals question mark, and part B, displacement equals question mark. All right, we actually have some things to fix in our known variables, please. I think those times are actually changes in time, not time. Oh yeah, that, that makes sense, because those aren't specific times like, you know, 2.31 a.m. or something like that. Rather, each one is a time duration. So please change each one to a delta t or a change in time. True, they're changes in time, not specific times. Good, that fixes part of it. Um, we are still missing some subscripts. We need a subscript on the displacement. Uh, part B says we need to find how far it moved. That, that, that means for the whole thing. So we're looking for the total displacement. So add a subscript of T for total to the displacement for part B. And we're actually still not done fixing our knowns. Uh, which velocity final are we trying to find? Uh, we, we want the velocity at the end of part two, which means we need to add a subscript of two to our fi the final velocity we're looking for. Correct, we're trying to find the final velocity for part two. And please realize that part two ends before the car stops moving. It's an important thing to realize. Bo, uh, how should we proceed from here? Well, we know we can use the UAM equations because they're part of the title of the lecture. <laughs> Bo, that's not going to fly. Um, I need to know from the problem statement itself, how do we know we can use the uniformly accelerated motion equations? Uh, oh, oh, because the, the accelerations are equal to numbers. 
the acceleration 1 equals 1.56 meters per second squared, and the acceleration 2 equals negative 2.07 meters per second squared, and those are both constant numbers, they don't change, uh, so we can use the UAM equations. That is correct, Bo. That's what the uniformly in UAM means. It means that the acceleration is constant. So at this point, I usually draw a picture, and that kind of helps us understand what's going on. So you can see from our drawing that the part where we're speeding up, I've labeled part one, and the part where we're slowing down, I've labeled part two. And I've listed the things we know for both parts. We know the acceleration and the change in time for both part one and part two. Let's review real quick. Class, remind me, there are how many UAM variables? Five. Five. There are how many UAM equations? Four. Four. If you know how many of the variables? Three. Three. You can figure out the other two. two. Which leaves you with one. Happy physics student. student. Yeah. Actually, that means we have a problem. We only know two of the UAM variables in each part. True, we are actually missing a variable. Why don't we watch the example one more time and see if you can see what we're missing. It starts out not moving. So the initial velocity is zero. The initial velocity for part one is zero. Yes, you can see it in the video, uh, and it's stated in the problem that the car starts from rest. Therefore, the velocity initial for part one is equal to zero. This is one of those uh, slightly hidden variables, one of those knowns that is a, sometimes hard to see. So you need to make sure that you're paying attention, and if it says something stops or something starts from rest, that means that the velocity at that particular point is equal to zero. On a side note, class, have we started solving the problem? Nope. No. Sadly, no. I will bring this up repeatedly because it's so important. As students, you often just want to rush your way through the problem. But really, the best way is to just slow down and understand everything first before you even start trying to solve the problem. Please, slow down. Do you understand? Yes. Yep. Sure. Good. Uh, Bobby, what should we do next? I know we have to start with part one because that's where we know our three UAM variables. However, I don't even know what to solve for in part one. Uh, you know what? That's fine. Sometimes it works that way. Um, let's just remind ourselves of what we're trying to find by adding them to our picture. So as you can see from our picture, we're looking for the total displacement from the beginning to the end, and we're looking for the final velocity for part two, and I just added, added the initial velocity for part one is equal to zero. So if you don't know what to do, let's just start by listing what we know, for example, for part one. Okay, uh, we know the initial velocity for part one is zero, the acceleration for part one is 1.56 meters per second squared, and the change in time for part one is 1 1.6 seconds. These are the variables that we know for part one. Uh, Bo, what can we use these three UAM variables to find for part one? Uh, the two remaining variables that we don't know for part one, uh, velocity final for part one, and the displacement for part one. I mean, we should solve for the final velocity for part one because it's the same as the initial velocity for part two. Absolutely correct. As you can see in the video, the ending point for part one is the same as the starting point, point for part two. In other words, the final velocity for part one is the same as the initial velocity for part two. Okay, Billy, please solve for the final velocity for part one. Wow, are we really just starting to solve the problem? Yeah, I bet it takes less time to solve than it does to understand. Yeah, you may be right. Uh, okay. Um, we just need to pick the correct UAM equation. Uh, let's see. Velocity final equals velocity initial plus acceleration times a change in time. Very close. Sadly, we are missing subscripts. Uh, please add um, ones to everything. Actually, and now we have all of the givens for this equation, so we can just plug in numbers. 
And what do we get for the final velocity for part one? Uh, 2.496 meters per second. Notice, now that we have the final velocity for part one, which we know is the initial velocity for part two, we actually know three UAM variables for part two. And we can now solve for the final velocity for part two or part A. Uh, Bo, please go ahead. I think we just used the same equation. Close, it's not exactly the same. Okay, different subscripts. Uh, so then velocity final for part two equals the velocity initial for part two plus the acceleration two times the change in time two. Uh, again, we have all the numbers. Uh, so the final velocity for part two equals the initial velocity for part two, which we just figured out to be 2.496 plus the acceleration for part two, uh, which is negative 2.07 meters per second squared times the change in time for part two, which is 1.1 seconds. And what do we get for an answer? 0.219 or 0.22 meters per second with two safe phase. Great, we figured out the final velocity for part two, 0.22 meters per second. This is part A. Uh, how about we work on part B now, the total distance traveled. Oh, the total distance will just be equal to the distance for part one plus the distance for part two. Very nice. The total displacement is the summation of the displacement for part one and the displacement for part two. And you can see that pretty well in our picture. Again, I just want to be careful to make sure that everybody understands that while they've asked for the total distance traveled and we're using the symbol for displacement, because we're moving in a straight line, the magnitude of the displacement and the distance traveled are the same thing. Important to realize. Um, Bobby? How do we find the displacement for part one? We could use the UAM equation. Displacement one equals one half times the quantity, velocity one final plus velocity one initial. That quantity times the change in time for part one. We have all those numbers, so then the displacement for part one equals uh, one half times 2.496 plus zero times 1.6, and we get 1.9968 meters. Okay, we have figured out the displacement for part one. Now we need the displacement for part two. Bo, well, how are we going to do that? We can use the UAM equation displacement for part two equals the initial velocity two times the change in time two plus one half times the acceleration two times the change in time for part two squared. Uh, plug in the numbers, we get 2.496 times 1.1 plus 1 half times negative 2.07 times 1.1 squared, which gives us 1.49325 meters. Great, we are almost done with this problem. We just figured out the displacement for part two. Billy, please finish the problem. Uh, okay. The total displacement, as I said, equals the displacement for part one plus the displacement for part two, uh, which is going to be equal to the 1.9968 plus the 1.49325. We get 3.49005 uh, rounded two sig figs. We get 3.5 meters. Excellent. We have now solved the problem. We figured out the final speed at the end of part two and the total distance traveled. I have a question about finding the total distance traveled. Why couldn't we, once we had figured out the final speed at the end of part two, have solved the problem this way? In other words, why couldn't we have looked at the whole problem and used one UAM equation? In other words, the displacement total is equal to one half times the velocity for part two final plus the velocity for part one initial times the change in time total. Where the velocity for part two final is the final velocity for the whole thing. And the velocity for initial for part one is the initial velocity for the whole thing. And the change in time total is the addition of the change in time for the first part plus the change in time for the second part. The question is, why couldn't we have solved the problem this way? It clearly gives us the wrong answer. 0.30 meters is clearly not far enough. But what is wrong with solving the problem this way?
It actually all goes back to the very beginning of the problem and why we could use the UAM equations in the first place. So think about that. Why could we use the UAM equations, which makes it so that we can't do it this way? Oh, it's not uniformly accelerated motion throughout the whole problem. Uh, yeah, uh, the acceleration is only constant during part one and then part two. And if you try to deal with the whole thing at once, the acceleration isn't uniform because it changes from 1.56 meters per second squared to negative 2.07 meters per second squared. Exactly. Please be careful to only use the UAM equations when the acceleration is uniform, when the acceleration is constant, when the acceleration equals a number which was true for part one and also true for part two, but not true for the whole thing. Because the acceleration is only constant for part one and for part two individually, but not the whole thing because it changes from part one to part two. So please be careful of that. Any questions? No. No. In that case, Bo, I will point out that you were correct. It did take us longer to understand the problem than it did to solve the problem, and that's okay. It actually isn't all that unusual. So just to review our understanding the problem, we listed everything that we knew. We drew a picture which identified uh, those different pieces. We split it up into two parts. We listed what we knew based on those two parts. We wrote out, wrote, we wrote out the equation we were going to use before we used it. We used subscripts. That always helps to understand what's going on. We went through it slowly and again, slowly methodically to understand what's going on before we try to solve the problem. Ladies and gentle people, I hope you enjoyed learning with me today. I enjoyed learning with you. Lecture notes are available at flippingphysics.com. Please enjoy lecture notes responsibly.